Annie Pasteur, and I'm the director of the International Studies Institute, and I also teach in architecture. That's my full-time job, actually. And it's I'm beyond excited to be um, welcoming all of you here to this uh, program. Our friend Shirley Lim was here in 2013, part of a conference that um, also included Diane Thiel and other colleagues called Cultures of Exile. More recently, I was following her um, work, her writing, and um, readings in Hong Kong, where was, she was invited at one of the universities there. I was following her through Facebook, and I was getting very jealous that we need to uh, hear her um, description of the democracy movement and also hear the poetry that came out of it. And so it all came together, and um, we're able to welcome her here. But uh, for the proper introduction, I would like to um, to invite Diane Thiel, um, our colleague, uh, professor of English and Creative Writing here at UNM, who had already been teaching uh, Shirley Lim's work in her classes before they met in person. And so she has seniority over that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also I would like to, to, to thank Beverly for bringing her class, uh, Visual Anthropology. So we actually have two uh, uh, two classes here, a poetry class and an anthropology class, and then everyone else. So welcome, and uh, thank you, Eleni. And um, Eleni asked me to do a bit of an impromptu uh, <laughs> introduction of Shirley uh, in this uh, this afternoon. And I will say that yes, in fact, I have been teaching her work for years and have anthologized um, her poetry as well as her uh, nonfiction from the uh, Among the Whitening Faces. Memoir of Loneliness that, uh, that she wrote um, quite a few years ago as well. And we're excited to have her back. Um, I, I enjoyed uh, uh, being part of that conference, The Cultures of Exile, that, um, that was two years ago. So it's very nice to have Shirley Gierk Lin Lim uh, back with us today talking about her recent work and, and experiences. Uh, she is a professor of English Emerita at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and an award winning Asian American writer. Her first collection of poems, Crossing the Peninsula, 1980, won the Commonwealth Poetry Prize, a first both for an Asian and for a woman. She is, an author, she is the author of seven poetry books, three short story collections, three novels, the Shirley Lim Collection, and a memoir, Among the White Women Faces, which received the 1997 American Book Award. She is the co-founding editor of JTAS, the Journal of Transnational American Studies, and the recipient of the Fulbright Distinguished Lectureship, Nian Kongsi Inaugural Distinguished Professorship Awards, and others. So please join me in welcoming Shirley Yuck. Thank you, guys. Um, is this on? Do I have to press something? It's on. OK, thank you so much. Mm. I want to begin by thanking Elena and Diane for inviting me back. This is my third time back in Albuquerque. And every time I come back, I'm struck uh, by the visual uh, images of the people I see. Uh, frankly, you guys look more laid back and cooler uh, <laughs> than, no, seriously, than the faculty and students at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm not sure what it is, um, but, um, and um, I'm really chuffed to be invited to do a talk uh, on this topic. Um, let me begin by asking a couple of questions. How many of you have been to Hong Kong? Show of hands. All right. So you'll be familiar with some of the stuff I'm talking about. How many of you are from the creative writing class? All right. And how many of you from the visual anthropology class? Right. OK, so you know, I'm used to wearing multiple hats, but usually one, time at a, uh, one, one hat at a time. Uh, today, I'm going to um, wear three. I was just at Southern Methodist University giving about the same talk, and I was wearing two hats, that of an academic and of a poet. But today I'm going to wear a third hat simultaneously, that of a teacher. So at some points I would like the um, creative writing students especially to sort of interrupt me if necessary, or to ask questions that have to do with their creative writing. Um, so let me uh, first of all talk about one hat. Uh, this is the chapbook from where I'll do my reading today, Embracing the Angel. Uh, it was published by the English Department at City University. 
uh, which has asked me every year that I've been there to give them the poems I write in Hong Kong to bring out in a chapbook. And this year, they asked not for my other Hong Kong poems, I usually have a lot of them, but only for my quote-unquote political pro-democracy poems. And it's called Embracing the Angel. Uh, it's because it's published by the university, it cannot be sold. Right? So I'm the only person with copies, and so I have a few copies for those that really, really would like one. Uh, I'm happy to give it away. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, uh, but this is the other hat. Um, so this lecture, by the way, and let me begin by saying it's very much a work in progress, partly because the pro-democracy movement, more widely known as the umbrella movement, is still ongoing. Although the actual events covered about 10 weeks and technically ended around December 10th last year, the protests continue and will certainly intensify as 2017, the date for the election of Hong Kong's chief executive or governor, draws near. The lecture is also a work in progress because the archives on the protest movement are even now being gathered. And numerous scholars from multiple disciplines, such as political science, media and communication, linguistics, international studies, cultural studies, and more, are posing significant research questions related to the movement. And as the speech by Common and John Legend at the Oscars demonstrate, this kind of transnational linkage uh, underlines the reverberations and meanings of the Hong Kong students' movement that still continue to accrete discursive global power. And this is what uh, was read out at the Oscar celebration. Recently, John Legend and I got to go to Selma and perform Glory on the same bridge that Dr. King and the people of the Civil Rights Movement marched on 50 years ago. The bridge was once a landmark of a divided nation, but now it is a symbol for change. The spirit of this bridge transcends race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, and social status. The spirit of this bridge connects a kid from the south side of Chicago, dreaming of a better life to those in France, standing up for their freedom of expression, to the people in Hong Kong protesting for democracy. And this was at the Oscars, right? Uh, right uh, here in uh, California. Um, and this is the kind of visual image uh, that the uh, very creative, anonymous people in Hong Kong are producing. So this is an image of the march over the bridge in Selma, and right below it is the image of the uh, umbrellas uh, that were involved uh, very heavily visually during the movement itself. So, student activism is very much an American phenomenon. Andrew Goodman, one of the three murdered in Missouri in support of the civil rights movement in 1964, was a student at Queens College, City University of New York. The free speech movement, beginning in 1964, will always be associated with UC Berkeley. It is also a European phenomenon. Think of the Paris May events in 1968, which likely set the model for later mass populist protests when university students like you, together with factory workers, occupied universities and working spaces in rallies that had, and I quote, artistic and festive aspects with numerous quasi-improvised debates and assembly songs, imaginative graffiti posters and slogans. Now this quote is from Wikipedia, but it pretty well sums up the Hong Kong students' protest for universal suffrage during the 10 weeks of urban occupation. Student protests are a common feature of 20th and 21st century political global politics, and the accompanying violence, casualties, and killings are well documented through news agencies and social media. What I wish to present today are some meditations on the convergence between Hong Kong student activists and their idealism, and the transcultural, transnational popular cultures these drew on, and in that historic dynamic, evident in a complex st strategic matrix of creative discourses, generating a rich stream of expressive arts that are even now being archived and studied. 
So the majority of the student activists were either not yet born or mere babies in 1997 when Britain handed over its former colony, a small territorial port city in its southern tip to China after 155 years of rule. A 19, uh, I'm sorry, a 2014 Baptist University survey found 41% of the radical pan-democratic supporters are below 30 in age, compared with just 23% of supporters of the moderate Democratic Party and Civic Party. That is, young people tend to be much more radical in Hong Kong. Raised in an intensely globalizing, cosmopolitan, highly capitalistic financial hub, Looking out to Western and Westernized cities such as London, New York, Sydney, Paris, and Singapore as sister cities, Hong Kong young citizens' sensibilities are profoundly post-colonial and global. In the run-up to the 1997 handover, hundreds of thousands of the city's subjects, fearful of communist rule, migrated chiefly to Anglophone nations whose histories were rooted in an original British Commonwealth. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and of course the US. Although up to 1997, Hong Kong had been ruled by British appointed governors, the apparently colonized Hong Kongers, many of whom had arrived as refugees from Chairman Mao's communist regime, enjoyed rule of law, press freedom, and freedom of assembly, worship, and speech. In the move to reconcile the city's subjects to their new rulers, the PRC, that's the People's Republic of China leaders, offered a one country, two systems governing structure, wherein the constitution and basic law understandings promised Hong Kong, quote, a high degree of autonomy, end quote, for 50 years. Ironically, it was the PRC that first raised the promise that in 2017, the territory's chief executive would be elected by universal suffrage. So this was a promise made by the PRC. The initial impetus to the present protest came from university faculty members, like some of you here. Uh, HKU law professor Benny Tai began the movement to ensure real universal suffrage would be implemented for the 2017 election. Modeled on the Occupy Wall Street protests, Hong Kong's, quote, Occupy Central with love and peace, Central referring to Hong Kong's financial district, began polling Hong Kong subjects for their position on the universal suffrage question, that is one man, one vote, right? And the June 2014 referendum, in which about one-fifth of the registered electorate voted, demonstrated popular support for the public to be allowed to nominate candidates, despite the PRC's posi position that only pre-approved candidates would be nominated. In short, for the PRC, it is one man, one vote, but you can only vote for the candidates we approve of. Right. Right? So that's the big question whether that is universal suffrage. Now, if the movement had remained at this sedate legislative mode, the world's media would not have been electrified by it. But on September 26, Joshua Wong, a leader of the scholarism movement, that he is in the middle, uh, which had organized a week-long classroom strike, led a large student group into Civic Square. Uh, here are some of the marches by the students. Um, uh, which is a fence off site in front of the government headquarters. The police pushback included pepper spray, tear gas and baton strikes. And it so enraged the city's subjects long accustomed to a polite police force during their many public demonstrations that a spontaneous mass civil disobedience movement began that very same night. So um, let me just show this to you again. So here are the students, right, uh, peacefully demonstrating, uh, marching in the streets and um, uniting together. Uh, there are eight universities there and this is very much a, a, a student um, 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 uh, action, um, including students from all over the world coming in support of Hong Kong students. So you had like a banner for Berkeley, you had students from Taiwan coming in support. Um, I don't th think that University of New Mexico sent anybody, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, so, and so this is the, 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 the first clash here. So my first poem that I'm going to read was, ac um, was actually the first poem I wrote 
um, and I wrote it on um, National Day, uh, which um, took place two or three days after the, um, the, 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 the violence began. And so I'm going to be reading from the poem. Sick as a poison pup, I hide in my computer, scrolling for news of a healthy earth. And everywhere the stings of our expedient wealth rise up, the skies pent and faint, the seas choke on rich red and green blooms, and the salmon lose their way home. I look out for my students, costumed in plastic and masked, hiding in plain sight from the guests their uncles and aunties have thrown at them. Families dying in the city as the children party, their joy and fear blown fresh through its streets, scribbles on the massive genealogical record gripped by old hands, hiding like me in their machine. And you have to understand that my students literally were among the demonstrators. Right? Many of them did not come for classes uh, until a few weeks later. They came to talk to me in their off my office. They wept in my arms. Uh, and to protect themselves from the tear gas, uh, they wore goggles and they wrapped themselves up in sarin wrap and you know, other kinds of plastic so that the pepper spray will not burn them. Um, so I was um, viscerally, uh, emotionally, very much invested uh, in what was happening in Hong Kong then. So, of course, uh, there's a, a, a lot of contention over what to call what was happening. For the pan-democrats, uh, this is a, a, a photograph of, of the, probably uh, there was about 200,000 people on the streets at one point, right? Um, they call this a movement. So it is the umbrella movement, all right? But of course, for the PRC, they call it a revolution. Mm. And the difference between movement and revolution, revolution is politically seditious. Uh, it is dangerous. Uh, the disruption is just not reformatory, but revolutionary. Uh, and so there's this contention over what to call it. Um, so based on these images that were circulated all over Hong Kong, and you know, every, everyone practically there had a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So there were all these images that all these smartphones were um, um, taking and immediately being posted on YouTube, on Twitter, everywhere, right? And I just was so moved by this entire mass demonstration that I wrote a poem uh, called Embracing the Angel, which is the title of my chapbook. The pen has not the power of the people. You stand, sit, speak, all hopelessly in love with the angel of freedom who offers you a future of fear and struggle. You choose, you choose her to spring out of the crushing present which promises loss, the ever-present sadness of wings cage that can never fly over your own homeland. This pen can trace that sadness, but only you have embraced the angel who is lifting you above the tear gas and ranked lines to see in this blissful hour the city you love unbarred. So among the young demonstrators, there were moments of pure euphoria, moments of pure joy. Uh, it was, you could see in their faces, in their actions, this, this, this feeling of communal uh, unity, uh, which is so rare um, to be experienced by anybody in the world. Uh, and this was what moved me so much uh, about my students and their actions. Um, so um, this violence, of course, led to demonstration, marches, occupations, and attempted occupations of other areas. Images all circulated by global media. The protests were mostly peaceful, but tear gas, pepper spray, and baton police violence crucially transformed the significance and scope of the students' movement. Um, so this poem that I just read to you tries to address the amazingly unexpected numbers that came out in support of the students and in open defiance of state-sponsored police repression. 
Now, given the time constraints, I will highlight only a few examples of the creative use of particular discourses to offer an understanding of the underlying political significance of such creative expression. So I'm not a political scientist. Uh, this is not a lecture that has to do with political science. I'm a poet and I'm an English literature professor, right? And so this is where I'm coming from. Um, I begin with a brief personal anecdote. In 2012, I attended the commemoration of the 1986 Tiananmen Massacre of Students that have annually drawn thousands to march through the steamy, hot Hong Kong streets. So every year in commemoration of the massacre, the Hong Kong people will come out and march through the streets. And that afternoon, I was struck by the sight of a number of demonstrators waving the British Union Jack and cooling themselves with fans painted with the British Bulldog. Um, that was the World War II symbolic representation of Sir Winston Churchill, noted for his leadership against Nazi Germany. It is this very public display um, of Hong Kong citizens' continued attachment to their British colonial masters, in contrast to their antipathy to the Chinese mainland that had theoretically freed Hong Kong from colonial chains, returning this global city to its rightful motherland, that has irked the PRC government and many of the mainlanders who have managed to follow the protests. Now, a brief aside, most Chinese mainlanders remain unaware of the students' movement, as this news has been censored uh, or shaped. So, you know, I was in China twice in the last few months, uh, uh, giving talks in Xiamen and Xi'an, and all the faculty and graduate students would complain they cannot access Google, Facebook, YouTube, and many other forms of social media, right? None of that is permitted uh, in this uh, nation of 1.3 billion people. Um, so as media commentators have noted, two different visions, and here I have an um, image of the Chinese uh, flag, the flag of the mainland, surrounded below by all these flags that are the British Union Jack. Right? So the question is, what is happening in this moment? Uh, what does this image, how do we interpret this image, right? Um, someone asked me a question, don't you think that this will be bad uh, for the protesters because they'll be seen as wanting to go back to Britain? And my response is no, that is too superficial and shallow a reading. Something else is happening and this is what I want to sort of present to you. What else is happening uh, in, in this kind of phenomenon? So the, the commentators have noted, and I quote, Two different visions of the future of Hong Kong and Greater China square off in the autonomous city. Surprisingly, the long-retired colonial flag has been adopted um, as a symbol for those who advocate a distinct <laughs> cultural and political identity for Asia's leading financial hub. So here are some more images of the flag. Um, so there, there are just multiple, multiple images of the demonstrators waving the flag, the British flag. So um, arguably, the communist regime's outrage with their Hong Kong subjects waving of British flags and the regime's interpretation of this action as proving that Hong Kong subjects suffer a colonized Western mentality opposed to motherland patriotism, uh, I would argue this kind of interpretation is embedded in a 20th century history of national humiliation and still rankling memories of Western depredations on the Chinese nation. Media censorship and decades long shutdown of news from outside of China have hardened this 20th century nationalist narrative that now rules the Communist Party and the government in Beijing. Hong Kong, however, even after the 1997 handover to the PRC was always and continues to remain a global transnational, multicultural, cosmopolitan city. And with this openness to what Arjun Appadurai has called the flows of ideas, media, capital, including press, academia, it has achieved fully global city status, marked by, among other things, cutting edge social media and a pro-democratic Hong Kong identity. So this is part of the argument that I'm working on right now.
In a study released recently, the non-profit research body Idea Centre asked more than a thousand Hong Kongers born between 1990 and 1999 on how they felt about their identity. While most see economic prosperity linked to the Chinese mainland, most would also rather keep the values they associate with the British legacy in the territory. 41% agreed that the city should strengthen its economic integration with China, uh, that is with the PRC. Only 30% said that a cultural integration should be pursued. So 70% is against, are against a cultural integration with the PRC. 22% were against further economic integration, but 39% openly opposed further cultural integration. Strikingly, and this is very important, only 13% said they could imagine living and working on the Chinese mainland on a longer term basis. That is, Hong Kong youth born just before or after the handover are a 21st century post-colonial generation to whom the PRC's anti-Western historical position is void of any meaningfulness. The opposing attitudes to the symbolic significance of the Union Jack testify not only to a generational gap, but also to incommensurable differences between two hegemonies. So with the PRC, the 19th and 20th century history of colonialism, with Hong Kong, this post-colonial global transnationalism, which is completely cosmopolitan. And hegemonies are um, group actions uh, and processes that try to uh, legitimize uh, um, a certain way of looking at the world, uh, to give it a certain symbolic order. So what you have in Hong Kong, I argue right now, uh, is the contestation of two hegemonies. Uh, one Hong Kong grown, and the other one actually with the PRC attempting to impose it and bring mm -hmm. it across the border. Um, an analysis of how and why the student movement may be said to have succeeded, and here I know I am contesting what a lot of um, the world media is saying that the student movement has failed. And I'm saying, no, no, it has not failed, it has succeeded. And this despite the fact that it did not achieve its aim of persuading the PRC to honor the Pledge of Universal Suffrage for 2017, or for the resignation of C.Y. Leung, the hugely hated chief executive. I argue that the success comes out of the highly creative nature of the improvisational, innovative, spontaneous, discursive power of crowdsourced communication. Not only through the deployment of highly technological electronic social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, hashtags, online publications and more, but also through the more conventional forms of banners, posters, post-its, concerts, on-site lectures and other forms. To give one illustration, as the protests intensified in October and November and the activists grew bold and more organized, clashes with the Hong Kong police forces multiplied. The world became familiar with images of the protesters opening colorful umbrellas in the face of police baton charges. Activists quickly adopted the term the umbrella movement as an ironic homage to their coalition and the useful protection that that homely object offered against tear gas canisters. So Times Magazine cover page of the image of a defiant lone protester braving the tear gas with only the defense of an umbrella. And later that umbrella was photoshopped and colored yellow, became the iconic image for the protest and for the police violence, uh, for the response of the police. The cover, the Times cover, took its power from the events on the ground. But the events on the ground also drew popular support and legitimacy from this sudden global visibility. Um, so here's an image on one of the sites at Murti uh, of the protest. And you have the Times cover posted all over the protest site. Right? So you see how one feeds the other. Um, so if orange was the color for the pro-EU revolutions in Eastern Europe, yellow is very much a color that has deep historical significance in Chinese civilization. Synonymous with gold, that most precious of metals, yellow was once a color to be used only for the imperial court. 
the Hong Kong protests seized on visual imagery, which is why visual anthropologists would be very, very interested in going there to study and to look at the archives, frankly. Um, they seized on visual imagery um, with profoundly historical, local, and Chinese significance, recirculating these as globally original icons rather than ancient Chinese icons, and reclaiming a multiplier effect when these images did then become global icons. That is, the movement discourses were above all powered, to my mind, not by the discourse of politics or of the social sciences, but of the imagination and the arts of the imagination, visual and literary, with the tools of illusion, collage, juxtaposition, and more. So the commonplace umbrella, colored yellow, entered world art as a symbol of these students' protests, and itself spun off numerous expressive puns and memes. Cartoonists, illustrators, artists, poets, writers, musicians, the occasion of protest with its overarching ideolo ideology of free speech and free assembly released a massive outpouring of creative energy. So um, I want to show you some um, images, because um, the time is short, so I can't do too much of it, and sort of make an argument uh, about the uh, uh, significance of shifting signifiers. So <laughs> how yellow begins to signify in different ways, how the umbrella begins to signify in different ways, how the Union Jack begins to signify, rather than as a symbol of colonialism, as a symbol of anti-PRC he hegemony. You know? So that, that's part of what I'm trying to say here. And that these uh, shifting si signifiers really come out from multilingual discourses, just not Anglophone, but Cantonese, and Mandarin, and uh, come out from transnational cultures and uh, point to a pro-democracy populist creativity. And so I think the major point I want to make, or want us to uh, look at, is how imagination works as a central political concept, right? Just not as a creative, expressive um, tool, but itself becomes um, charged uh, with political power, uh, and how political power itself becomes charged by imagination. So here's the power of the imagination at work, uh, the, the sign here. Power of imagination, power to the people. All right? uh, and so the word imagination gets repeated uh, on the sites themselves in a visual manner, uh, as well as in the music uh, that was being performed and in the speeches that were being made. No, just not freedom, of course freedom was being stated all the time, and especially universal suffrage, but the term and the word imagination itself. So this is uh, a slide of what was called the Lenin Wall after John Lennon. And uh, up above they had in Chinese uh, a long strip that said, um, if, uh, you, uh, if I'm a dreamer, then I'm not the only one. And you know that came from uh, Lennon's wonderful uh, lyrics uh, in Imagine, right? Um, and um, so the, the, the Lennon song Imagine was uh, uh, an opening end theme. Uh, which was then later taken over by end themes in Cantonese, composed for that moment. Uh, and the Lennon Wall was where everyone would go up and there was a, a stack of post-its. Uh, and you would take a post-it and you write a message on it and you'll post it along the wall. So there were godzillions uh, of these post-its. So what I'm trying to say is that, in a way, this um, push and discourse for universal suffrage took on a kind of a universalist power. Uh, and we have here the fusion of civil liberties and art, visual music, literature, tech, multimedia. And what I would say is Martin Luther King meeting John Lennon, meeting Steve Jobs, <laughs> right? Because what is Apple's logo? Imagine. And when you look at the expressive media that was being used by all these young people and not so young people, um, <laughs> the whole Apple sort of push about Imagine uh, was just overpowering. Um, um, here is a close-up uh, of the uh, Lennon Wall. You can see so many thousands of people came, including practically every tourist that arrived in Hong Kong then. Uh, and they would write these little things that they were just hanging down, and there were layers and layers of them. So you can see the layers here. 
uh, and what people wrote. Uh, there were messages from people from Australia, Canada, Sweden, Poland, everywhere. Uh, I, of course, wrote a message as well. And um, the academics and scholars that I knew realized that when the movement would end, as it would have to inevitably end, all this would be trashed. Right. So um, there was a strong call uh, for the scholars and their uh, research assistants to come out and take photographs of these post-its. And uh, almost, I don't know how successful the entire thing was, but a great deal of it was being done. One of my dear friends, Rodney Jones, told me that he went out and he spent hours just doing this little bit because you would take a photograph and then you'd peel it out and then do the second layer. And then you peel it out and do the third layer. Then you peel it out and do the fourth layer, and then you have to put it all back again, <laughs> right? You know, and that's really time-consuming, uh, intensive labor. Um, but but all this is now archived. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's trash, but it's not trash. Um, so these are the innovative tools um, that I would say um, came out during that moment, right? Who would know post-its would be so powerful? Um, <laughs> So here I have an image um, that um, talks about the use of um, uh, traditional mythical Chinese figures. So here is the mythical Chinese warrior hero uh, known as Guangdong, the god of war and literature. You know, simultaneously, he's for war and literature. One hand holds a sword, the other hand holds a, uh, a pen. Um, um, now, the unknown artist recreated the god in yellow and carrying not a sword or a pen, but an umbrella. So um, here is Umbrella Man. Um, and uh, this is a known artist. I didn't take down his name here. And he stood at the Admiralty site, uh, the focus of hundreds of thousands of photographs, an image repeated almost everywhere, except, of course, in the PRC, where such images were firewalled off. So all these. Uh, protesters and tourists and Hong Kong people would come and post next to Umbrella Man and take a photograph. So Umbrella Man has been destroyed, obviously, right? But Umbrella Man has not been destroyed because there are all these images that have been recorded. Um, so what I want to do is talk a little bit about Umbrella Man. While Umbrella Man may be viewed as somewhat lacking in aesthetic appeal, I mean, no one can say this is, um, you know, aesthetically something you want to put in an art museum, maybe. As a political allegory, it drew on memories of that lone figure seen confronting the tanks that were headed to Tiananmen Square, right? That figure with his shopping bag in front of those tanks, halting that mighty military. And also, of course, alluding to the goddess of democracy that the students in the Beijing protests had constructed. And therefore, also, the goddess of democracy was an allusion to our own Statue of Liberty on Liberty Island in New York, which is itself a gift from the French people, <laughs> cementing the two nations' common ideals of liberty, <coughs> equality, and fraternity. Umbrella Man thus may be seen as drawing from the goddess of democracy in Tiananmen, which drew from the Statue <coughs> of Liberty, which spoke to the revolution in France that overthrew despotic mo monarchy and put in place a republic with universal suffrage. Similarly, the colors of the movement were yellow and black. Students wore black tees and yellow ribbons. Um, the, um, and the uh, uh, banners uh, were in yellow and black. I don't know if you can see them there. Um, all the banners were in yellow and black, and tees were made with yellow and black. I'll go back and talk about these separately. Um, so here is a poem. And that's the thing. If you want to do research on the movement, it really helps to be trilingual. It helps for you to know both uh, English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. And in fact, most of the um, 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 banners and posters and visuals and um, slogans were in Cantonese and Mandarin, and very few of them in English. Um, so here's a poem that was then translated uh, from uh, the Twitter site that I went to. Black nights gave me black eyes. I'll use them to find the light. It's a, a really powerful poem, uh, even translated into English. Um, so let me just show you a few here. So uh, the umbrella, of course, you know, was iconic. Uh, so 
this uh, kind of banner uh, was all over Hong Kong. So at my own university, uh, the students just had masses of this uh, for you to pick up, right? Including uh, the, um, the, the, the yellow badge. I was wearing this yellow um, ribbon throughout until one student told me not to do it because she said that she was on the train, the MRT with the yellow ribbon, and someone assaulted her. Right, someone who did not agree with the movement. So it was better not to openly uh, uh, display uh, your political affiliation. Um, so uh, I just want to show you a few more things here. So here you see, this is President Xi of China. And this is another expressive, um, I um, imaginative sort of re memeing of the figure. Uh, there was a popular photograph of him visiting a, a factory in mainland China, and it was raining, and he carried an umbrella, and he rolled up his trousers to show you know, how, how sympathetic he was to the workers of China. And this was re adopted by the movement people, and they colored the umbrella yellow, right? So he's seen holding this yellow umbrella. Um, uh, and here, um, in yellow and black, protect endangered species, it's in Chinese as well, and it says, uh, protect endangered species, Hong Kong. So the Hong Kong people, Hong Kong identity is an endangered species. And here in Mong Kok, uh, this is a cardboard cutout of um, um, President Xi with a yellow umbrella. Um, so this cutout, um, which was put in many, many different places, became one of the most popular totemic images to be photographed next to during the protest. So the tourists that came from the PRC very happily went and <laughs> posed there to take a photograph of themselves next to it. Now, the, the Hong Kong government had complained that the student protest was costing the city godzillions of money because uh, the tourists were not coming, businesses were out of money. And yet, uh, John Sang, who was um, the finance um, a person in the cabinet, uh, recently made a speech saying that tourism went up uh, by about 8%, <laughs> and the business uh, uh, profits uh, went up by 12%. That is, during the time of the protest, more tourists came from the mainland and elsewhere because they wanted to see what was happening with the protest. Mm. Right? So it itself became a very popular tourist site. Um, uh, despite what the government said. So you can see the use of visual pun, the kind of immediacy, mobility uh, of these kinds of visuals, and the kind of visual literacy you need to do that. And we have to remember that all of this is crowdsourced, created by anonymous craftspeople. Right? No one signed his name and said, I did this cutout. I don't think this would happen in the US. Right? The US, you know, if one creates something, the name must be there. Somehow that's this uh, idea of copyright and uh, you know, intellectual property. Um, and so in some ways, I would even argue that this is very communitarian in a very Asian kind of way. Um, but not all is fun and games. Right? Uh, not all is visual punning. Not all is creative play. Not all is expressive uh, um, thing. There was violence there. So, you know, I haven't done, because the paper is, um, has, is time limited. What, are the, what is the significance of using color? What is the color of courage? What is the color of outrage? What is the color of violence? So my next poem tries to um, take up this notion of the colors of yellow and black as allegorical figures for the movement. So the poem is titled Black and Yellow. Like a kick in the head, days later, still black, Red cuts separating to yellow. Like burning retinas will set on black fire, yellow pain in eyes worse the pain in seared faith. Like black tomorrows, marching goose-footed, mush phosphate, slaughtered, livers rich with yellow fat. Like yesterday's news already blacked out from the yellow papers yesterday. Like blacking out before the fury of the yellow emperor risen from his tomb in Xi'an. Like black armbands on mourners moaning the city, drowning in the Yellow River. Like black resisting the stains of history, wearing its badge of true gold. Now to the creative writing students, I'd like you to consider how you make poetry out of political events. Right? This is usually seen as so un-American. Political poetry it cannot be really good poems, right? 
you know, good poems are all about. And I write those poems all the time, so I'm not putting it down. Um, but at that moment, what I was feeling was this sort of political engagement, and that's where the poems are coming from. And there's so much in the U.S. to engage us politically now. Do you know what I'm saying? And I don't see the poems coming out yet. Right? Maybe it's coming out in rap poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's not coming out from poetry poetry. Uh, and I'm wondering what's the difference between rap poetry and poetry poetry. Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? Why is it that the things that are happening in the US, some of it perhaps just as bad sure. as what was happening in Hong Kong, right? Um, so there was a moment when the Hong Kong protesters did this. You recognize this? Yes. Right? So that image from Ferguson, the Hong Kong protesters were picking that up. And I'm looking at our young students and saying, what are you guys picking up? I mean, this, this is just a question I'm asking, you know, and I'd like you to ask that of yourself when you do your creative writing, when you do your papers on visual anthropology and stuff like that. Uh, what are you picking up, uh, not even globally of what's happening outside the U.S., but what is happening in your state, mm -hmm. right? Not even outside your state. Uh, what are you writing about? What are you feeling about? So the last point, perhaps, that I'd like to make um, is the extreme youthfulness of the participants in this movement. Um, so many parents brought their young children to the rally. Some came with babies, infants, toddlers, and many more secondary school students were among the protesters who slept on Hong Kong highways for 79 days of the Occupy sit-in. So here is a, uh, a, a poster uh, put up by uh, children from an art school, and it says in Chinese, translated into English, we are a group of kids from a children's art group. Our parents and teachers hope that through colors and drawings, we can support you and express our sympathy to you, especially our friends who have suffered injuries. How difficult. And then you can see that sort of naive, right, uh, very young images. And of course, you don't see this in the US. You don't see primary and secondary school children coming out and their parents bringing them um, to protest Ferguson, let's say, right? You know, you just don't see that. Um, so, so this was the other thing that just struck me so forcibly, um, the extreme youthfulness uh, of the people uh, involved in this. So I wrote a poem called The Children's Movement. And uh, in my mind now, I no longer even call it the student's movement. I call it the children's movement. Um, and I begin with a quotation from the South China Morning Post interviewing a student, a uh, secondary school student, who says, I'm here because I love Hong Kong. I'd love to hear secondary school students say, I'm here because I love the United States. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be something, you know? At any rate, you are nine or 11 or perhaps 13 or 16. In all your years, you've obeyed father and mother, pushing your questions down each day deeper into a dungeon of your making. Each year has brought you new sweets, gifted for your tray full of past year's treats, many untasted, paid for, you know, with father's gloom, mother's patient smiles. And it is there your love not the tray that keeps you company in your room in their absence. Obedience is love, love, obedience. Until that flesh lit up their absence and another briefly, clearly showed the contours of your dungeon in which your questions have crouched like rats growing larger, fiercer, the longer unfed. And the 87 flashes illuminated brighter than neon a radiation imprinted on your retina to rival the lights from thousands of smartphones, an intelligence of injustice, a lesson that pierced first your mind, penetrating the brain's protective tough membrane as with an X-ray dye, then changing the equations that regulated the universe, your deep heart's core. And you see, you see, love is disobedience, disobedience, love and the dungeon doors open for you and your questions to walk through. Uh, I have uh, a number of these children's uh, uh, movement uh, 
poems. The next one is called your exercise books. What are a few days in the book of changes? Not even a blot in an exercise book. The first stroke of a child, the first time he holds a brush wet with the black dissolved from the ink slab, bowing before the years of obedience, extending his wrist to the calligraphy of his people, more poetical than any other human language. What are a few days in a student's years, reciting lines assigned, bowing hungry before the test pages, passing like stale sushi, circling endlessly in a nightmare counter? What are a few nights of bad and good dreams, wafting like Joss the granny's light for superior grace, smoke to mingle with the temple soot from other grannies now lying in unvisited graves? What are a few drifts of incense in the guest clouds condensed in the tears of children who had not known they were warriors? What are these few days in the children's exercise books blotted thick with the tears of this learning. Um, and it is this learning that uh, I wrote about that suffused the streets of the protests. Of course, as I said earlier, to access this phenomenon, the researcher needs to be trilingual. For the 24-7 instructions on civil disobedience was carried out in Cantonese, Mandarin and English. Students' English language political instruction and communication was chiefly aimed at university com communities and at professors like me. All right, so this was all over and it was for uh, international visiting faculty and um, resident visiting faculty and so on and so forth. Um, over 90% of Hong Kong people are Cantonese speakers and readers. But in the streets, the language of protest was Cantonese, and even the writing was not formally Mandarin, but Cantonese inflected. The protest sites were thick with visual instruction, many exhorting the protest to keep in mind public decorum. So no smoking, no drinking, no undue noise, no debate, no festive activities. So you can see here uh, in English translation, don't forget the original reason why we are occupying Admiralty. And then in another sign, civil disobedience is not a carnival. Mm -hmm. right. So there's all this exhortation to the young people that they have to be serious, they have to be mindful of why they're there. It's not for fun and games, it's not to have a concert, it's not to drink. So you would go to the site, there were no beer bottles, there were no whiff of weed, you know, there were no cigarette stubs. Uh, it was just amazing, frankly. Um, so here it is in English, so you can have a look at it. Beware of persuaders to leave, right? People who would want to persuade us to leave. Remember, we are a protester, not in, a car in carnival. We need the government grant us real democracy and fair election. No karaoke. No picnic photo, <laughs> no progressive victory, no leader organizer, beware of useless group discussion. <laughs> and down below, lefted, leftist retard, 60s hippies junkies, equal Chinese spies. <laughs> so if you go in there and you're a hippie and you're blah, 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 you're really a, you know, uh, someone who's trying to provoke, right? Um, so that kind of discipline, uh, that kind of uh, um, management, would you say, of public image, of the entire movement uh, was just really very, very impressive. Uh, and it didn't come from a command up there. It came from the ground. It came from the young people themselves. As they say, no leader, no organizer. Right? It was all, if you want to use that word within quotation marks, it was all spontaneous. Um, uh, here's another one here. Um, and um, the protests were also supported by the churches, the Christian churches, uh, particularly the Protestant churches. And here there's one uh, that says uh, a quotation from 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I, ta I talked as a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And what it is, of course, is an appeal to the young people to note that they're going through a transition, isn't it? From childhood to manhood, to maturity, uh, using biblical language 
uh, to make clear that this is the transition uh, that they are going through. So the youthfulness of the population in the streets achieved, to my mind, a number of political purposes. First, the movement was able to deploy the traditional Chinese esteem of scholars with its emphasis on the studious seriousness of the participants. So in the streets, study halls were constructed. Desks were built daily. Uh, so here are the, the desks with the students sitting there on the protest site studying. Uh, here's one of, uh, um, these are retirees and older people and they're constructing, you know, every day more and more desks out of pieces of wood uh, for these study halls. Um, there were libraries with books that, you know, um, the participants could just pick up. Uh, and there were classes and lectures being held. Um, so um, these images, these activities highlight the protesters' status as scholars and their commitment to their education. Uh, it is a fully Confucianist ethos, ironically in full compatibility with President Xi's re-establishment of Confucianism as a truly Chinese civilizational ideology. Right? This is the ironic complete overlap uh, between the two sort of figurations of Chinese culture. Moreover, the scholastic agenda filled the days with classes, tutorials, and study dates, reassuring parents that their children were continuing their studies even as they were out in the streets. Of course, tutors are a common social educational tool in Hong Kong and all over Asia, and private lessons in English, math, chemistry, and so forth often cost hundreds of dollars uh, per lesson. So the carrot of free tutorials that were always being advertised, oh, I'm going to set up this corner and I'll give you free tutorial in English, this carrot was not insubstantial. The lectures, classes, tutorials, study halls resulted in a unique protest movement where children and their guardians, grandparents, retirees, uncles and aunties occupied the streets rather than the workers or militant left-wing anarchists. So I would also say arguably that the presence of the very young and the very old in these protests served to ensure that the PRC would not use a militaristic put-down of the occupiers, right? It is one thing to massacre university students in Beijing. It is quite another matter to massacre school children and their grandparents. Um, so that, 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 that extreme youthfulness and extreme seniority itself, I would argue, was a protective measure of the protest movement. So I'm going to end with... Um, here are some street scenes and you can see how they just took over, you know, the, the streets uh, so that the limos, the buses and everything else, taxis had to stop. Um, um, just some of these images here. So um, some of these poems try to address those images that I just showed you. The streets. The streets fill and empty, fill, empty, fill, strangers speaking together for the first time strange utterances, the old language of their people. The ground in steeples where their feet had been forbidden to occupy now susurrate with tongues escaped from the young's seven obediences, women's three obediences, obedience of the machine. In a city made by machines, the streets settle for the night, people occupied. The mind of the people busy with <coughs> fingers, subtle, multicolored meaning under the single star of the machine. Duty blunt in iron, beaten in fire, invincible in smoke. And the reference, of course, is to the People's Liberation Army, uh, which has um, its um, military there on the island, right near where the um, demonstration strikes were. But they did not come out. But everyone knew that they were there. Right? Um, so there was this sort of overarching uh, fear, anxiety, uh, threat. Um, and there are many, many images I didn't have time to show of uh, especially the retired women and men making little umbrellas to hang up, you know, uh, doing different types of expressive um, origami. Uh, it was just, you can just get them if you go on, on to the web. You can get all these images. Um, um, so here's another city poem. And as um, the strikes, uh, as the demonstrations went on, um, my poems began to reflect uh, that tension, 
what's going to happen next? This isn't going to continue too much longer. How is it going to end? And so, um, you know, you can see there's a change in, in the whole tone of the poems I was writing at that point. The city in fragments. Summer's fetid breath suspends through October and November. The sky leaks chemical dew. Still, we try to see the city through its harsh, pale air, a strange egg pulsing with unhatched hopes. Among the school children, wizened uncles and grannies who've eaten birthday long noodles now urge sweet tea and candies, weep at the idea of grandchildren dying. When hope slips away at noon to sleep in another bed, will the betrayed keep faith? The occupied streets shape couplets in a city of many poems. Hopes of freedom unshackle, but only the free man will rise and stay. The carriages that can pull up at any time are not always to carry you home. The uniformed have no <coughs> use for another's uniform. Obey at your own risk. Multicolored homes have been drawn into history books too many, read by too many, ever to be exterminated in the bonfires <coughs> torched by those who are hired to believe in only one history. Some children spend this Saturday skating on a giant ice block, freedom blasting past their crouched bodies and ending at the end of the board hour. Some children waken to tutors, the drill pages presented each weekend like minute hands ticking by <coughs> exactly to tip the hour hands forward. Freedom is unknown to clocks. Some have been up in the dark, tears salt already disappeared into the morning porridge. Some have woken, bones creaking like the bones of their old folk, rising from the road's unforgiving measure of their growing up, believing unbelief. For when they will leave these streets, life moving on, their poetry safe in books, changing the one unrevised history to ordinary stories when children fledge free. So I will end um, by reading you one of my many farewell poems, because I was leaving on February the 13th. Uh, this was after the movement was over. Um, and here's a photograph of the harbor uh, with the ferries passing up and down. Uh, and I have multiple farewell poems to Hong Kong. You know, when you're reluctant to leave, you keep saying goodbye and goodbye. Um, riding the ferry. We will ride the ferry from central to Simsas Way, to and fro, giddy like stones skipping a pond just for the skipping, sinking unrecoverable into bottom scum. And if witty roots will nudge them, we will not know. Fairies are not always for crossing, nor always about goodbye. Like dumb animals, they are steered to skylines of air and crystal, drawn to algorithms. We write them once, twice, thrice, in longing farewell to squares and corners, dead ends and alleys, each a stone skipped over our heart's water into which have settled public gardens, these mildewed walls, these stalls of rainbow shoelaces, these locksmith's iron array, these bent pushes of carts, these children who slept on city streets, who sit in school, stony hopes in pockets, ready for skipping across the harbour and border tomorrow. And this is what the young people say. We'll be back. <laughs> so yes, the movement is over, but the movement is not over, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and especially, you can see that activism now on the internet, yes. where they cannot be guessed, cannot be batoned. Uh, so this young woman uh, has started uh, this ac internet activism, and which is called Keyboard Frontline, and there's a group called Young Inspiration. Um, and you know, I guess young people tend to be more techy uh, um, minded. Uh, so there's a great of this, a great deal of this kind of activism continuing before they go back to the streets. Uh, it's already happening on the cyber highways, right? So I'll stop here and maybe for your questions, but I want to do thank you for your attention and time.
Yes. Okay. First, a couple of quick comments, and that is, even though I don't think you really serve primary age children, during the anti-Vietnam demonstrations in the United States, uh, I know in high school I came out, and so did other high school <coughs> students, and that was true of the freedom rides in the civil rights movement. Uh, my question is, with the comment that quote, you know, the the press is saying, you know, it wasn't successful, it's all over. How do you, and I see so many parallels with the Occupy movement, the libraries, for example, the, <coughs> the, the teachings. Um, do you, how do you feel about the future or the impact of Occupy in the United States? Wow. <laughs> uh, no, that's okay. Um, I, I'm just trying to draw parallels between the two. I'm not sure, you know. I have to tell you, I'm a little bit more pessimistic yeah, about um, political protest in the United States. Right. Um, there is a hard rock uh, of resistance. So it's true that the arc of the moral universe uh, is very long, but it bends towards justice. But that bending gets unbent again and again, mm -hmm. right? So you fight one battle and you think you've won it, like the battle for uh, a woman's right to her body. Yeah. And then you turn around and suddenly you're losing it again. Yes. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's, you know, I use, I mean, I'm very pro-Obama, so I, and I love, this was the thing that was my mantra, right? It bends towards justice. And I suddenly realized that it's not inexorable that you can lift it up so that it unbends mm -hmm. in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know about Occupy Wall Street, frankly. Yeah, yeah. I really can't answer that question to tell you the truth. Um, there's one other comment about the young people, and that is, uh, I was very, uh, there's been a movement in the last few days or protests of s school age children, probably more secondary, but I think some with primary as well, uh, protesting the standardized exams here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice if they made the connection with the profits of corporations. I don't know that they have. I would yeah. like to give priority to the students on the classes yeah. right here because Sorry. they only have ten, five minutes or ten minutes. So uh, anyone from the creative writing or the visual anthropology class would like I'm to make a comment <laughs> even? <laughs> comment or question? Well, I'll make a comment just yeah. since you directed a question to the uh, the creative writing students you right. talked about you know, the, the political in right. poetry. And it's kind of interesting because that was highly unplanned. I, they don't know. They've just turned in some p political poems to Oh, me. that's <laughs> wonderful. We actually had uh, them write in sort of reading your work, and, and, and uh, I gave them the choice of, po of you know, something um, political or regarding a sense of place or both. You know, ah. And um, we were talking also about the political as being sort of history as your own heartbeat, to sort of quote Michael right. Parker, or, um, or the, the Polish poet Wisnowski Zimborski, who says, you know, whether you like it or not, your genes have a political past. You know, yes. And so on. So, yes. Um, and, uh, and so talking about all the types of political. You know, yes, right, that, right, that, right. So and of course, what feminism says is that the personal is the political, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that's the way we can keep that in sight. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, um, in the U.S., it used to be called uh, flash mobs, is it? Yeah. Wasn't there a term? Where you just go into the smartphones and you tell your friends and your friends tell your friends and their friends tell their friends and their friends tell their friends. And, their friends, their friends. and within 15 minutes, everybody converges in one place. Yeah. Right? So mobilizing is not difficult in terms of technology. It's motivating people to be mobilized. And what happened in Hong Kong were the almost instantaneous circulation of images of police brutality on the young students. Mm -hmm. And that got the Hong Kong citizens so outraged that the adults, the seniors came out. Hmm. Right, so it was no longer just, oh, the students are just having fun and games. They've got a lot of time on their hands. We people have to work. They turned out, the working class turned out. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and it was police brutality. Really, and of course, by U.S. standards, that police brutality might be seeming quite mild, <laughs> because they never did use um, lethal weapons, yeah. right? But for Hong Kong, 
the tear gas canisters and the pepper spray and the batons. Just like, what? <laughs> you know, who's heard of this? The last time that kind of brutality happened was in the 1960s. Um, so does that answer your question a bit? Yeah. Any other questions? None at all? I thought this was an Asian thing, that Asian students never ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess it is a New Mexican thing as well, huh? Maybe it's a US thing. Any, any qu yes? Could you share some of the um, words you saw written on the John Lennon wall, on the post-it? Would I share what? Some of the messages that you've seen written. On the John Lennon wall. Um, things like, we support you, or we love you, we're proud of you. Um, they were all positive. Um, it's, um, you know, after a while you stop reading them because there was nothing new, mm -hmm. right? They were just the same messages of support uh, all over. Um, m well, I would say less than 5% were in English. Uh, most of them were in Chinese, uh, some were in German uh, or Swedish or, you know, wherever the writer came from. Um, they were really international, the post-its. Um, and I, 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 I pity the scholar that will be working on accessing those archives <laughs> because there were literally hundreds of thousands of those post-its. Mm -hmm. I showed you that image, you could see that the wall was just plastered with post-its, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was so brilliant of the student organizers or whoever it was to put a pile of post-it pads yeah. and markers mm -hmm. so anyone could write it and then leave the marker and go and post it. I mean, who would have thought of it? it was, isn't it brilliant? And so that everyone who came to the site left a little uh, a trace of his consciousness or his involvement. And you know, when you leave a trace, you are more committed to that moment, right? You're just not walking through. You're leaving a, something of yourself behind. Uh, you're articulating something. And, and, and that, that articulation, that trace, just adds to the power so that the whole site itself seemed to have an aura almost of, of, of a certain energy. I cannot explain it. And I remember Elena sent uh, a, a, an email to me saying that what you were there and you went to the site. And what did you say? Would you tell them? Well, it was the day before they were officially supposed to take them down. Uh -huh. And it was very much uh, capturing what you were describing also, this uh, sense of teaching and that all these desks had information and they well managed. But for me, and I only spent four days in Hong Kong, and so I'm not an expert, but I wanted to put it in um, the broader um, experience of being in a city that was so civilized and well mannered. I mean, the fact that everyone walks into the subway in an orderly manner, so and everyone is polite to everyone around. So I can understand um, your describing their shock at police brutality because it seems like people know what to do without being told. And even the young students we saw were walking in an orderly, but not militaristically orderly, just a very well-mannered way. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so it was, um, and the wall, uh, I didn't know it was called the man on the wall, but yeah. that was a very powerful yeah. Uh, yeah, example. Yeah. It reminded me of um, protest in Athens with tear gas there. Yeah. And, um, that mobilized people yeah. and made them more a sense of community yeah. between them. Yeah. But the term the Lenin Wall, of course, sort of associates itself with the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, so all the walls that have appeared historically in protests uh, and changes in regime and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. I want to say that there were uh, that the, the major narrative of youthfulness and of discipline uh, was just repeatedly. Um, um, spoken, uh, there was a photograph of a young girl, maybe 13 or 14, in her school uniform. Many of the children went in their school uniform, mind you. And she was sweeping um, the protest streets. So the protesters were clearing the, the, the garbage, and they had um, uh, recycling places, and they were recycling the paper um, containers for drinkies and squashing them and so on and so forth. So everything was very, very um, uh, orderly and environmentally sound. And someone made the comment, which I thought was uh, almost funny, was that for some of these young people at home, they never use a broom. They never clean up after themselves because they have <laughs> mates, right? 
you know, they, 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 they're children of fairly rich people, some of these uh, students. And there they were at the sites and they were cleaning up and they were, you know, feeding each other and so on and so forth. So that, I think, was this teachable moment. I call it Democracy 101, right? <laughs> Where these young people were suddenly exposed to a very different way of thinking about themselves and their city and their identity and social commitment. And this is um, a, a transformation of consciousness that I don't think will ever leave them. You know, you go to certain classes and you come out transformed. Right? You, it just stays with you. You, you become a, a different person. Uh, this is what um, Rilke says. Art has to change your life. And in some ways, the art of the streets that you see here, that, uh, to my mind, that art of the streets, that imagination, uh, has and will continue to change the lives of those young Hong Kong people. Um, yes, please. Downside of media is, I mean, the upside is that it can mobilize people so quickly. But all of the, this media also allows myself and others to feel as though we are participating in something without actually participating. Mm -hmm. Because all we have to do is hit a like button or forward. You mean like Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Facebook yeah. in particular. But Twitter works the same way as well. You know, yeah. and, um, I think that that's the downside and something we need to. I have a yeah. friend who says you will never see the young people of the United States resist what's happening here the way they did in the 60s as long as they have a new iPhone. Well, you know, the Hong Kong kids all have iPhones. <laughs> They're all Twitters, right? They did an interview with young Joshua Wong, who's just turned 18, I think. He started the scholarism thing when he was 15. So he's very much, you know, and he is someone with dyslexia. So he was invited to UCLA two weeks ago to give a talk. And they interviewed him and, uh, in Hong Kong. And the interviewer noted that uh, Joshua Wong was there with his girlfriend and also with another friend because teenagers like to hang out together. <laughs> And I think that's what we have to remember. So the, the majority of those protesters were teenagers. You know, it's truly amazing to me. Um, you know, when I was a teenager, I was just like, oh, I'm smoking. Isn't that very transgressive of me, you know? <laughs> I'm serious, right? And here are these young people, they say, no, no, no smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more serious things to do, yeah. psychological environment we live in as consumers because we are kind of the hub of this high consumer culture which they occupy was challenging but it's based in individuality and freedom so I think that the United States especially young people here ha are, are psychologically affected maybe in a, a way that young people in other parts of the world are not to be incredibly concerned with the self and with freedom and with individual choice, mm. and that that can actually be a barrier to mm. engaging mm. with other people in social movements. Um, yeah. I think it's a, it's a barrier that you can break down, yeah. but I think it's something that's intrinsic in America, in the way we've all been raised as Americans. Mm. 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 And that's something I've been kind of mulling over in relation to, like, I think Occupy had its successes, and part of it was that it connected people who yeah. now have taken those connections and gone on to form other projects and organizations mm -hmm. and sort of continued dialogues. Mm -hmm. But that connection, I think, was even harder mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and kind of more tenuous because of the, the psychological environment of this mm -hmm. like extreme individuality and embracing your own freedom means not connecting to others, not being part of anything bigger. Yeah. I like that term you use, embracing your own freedom. And I think maybe that's the advantage and disadvantage uh, of being the United States. Yeah. It is the land of the free. We are permitted to embrace our own freedom. But that freedom is always under threat. It's always being undercut. Uh, and I don't think the young people see that threat. Mm -hmm. They don't understand uh, how that freedom can be so easily lost in the land of the free by the people they have elected. 
You know, the people you've elected are the people who are threatening your freedom. And I don't think young people understand that, right? And also, of course, uh, Americans don't vote until they, what, 21 or is it 18? 18, 18 yeah. But uh, is it in Greece or wherever they're going to bring the voting age down to 16? I can't remember where it is. Yeah, and, and I really think that bringing the voting age down to 16 might be very helpful in this country. Um, or making it mandatory like in Australia. Yeah, correct. <laughs> yeah. But guess who would be against it? I mean, we already have a governance where the majority of the voters are one way. And the people who get elected do not reflect the numbers of the voters, right? And that's a real issue. Why is it you have maybe 60% of the voters voting one way, but the majority of the people who go to Congress do not reflect the 60%? Is, I mean, is that therefore a democracy, right? So I have no idea, but these are questions that people should be mulling and not having other people scream across, you know, on a TV set at you. I mean, I hate watching those TV things, you know. But to have young people think of these um, equations, these puzzles, and creatively try to express their own take on it. Um, but these things, of course, are forbidden uh, in schools. Uh, these kinds of discussions are not allowed in the curriculum. And is it, is it, is it in Kansas or someplace, I don't want to badmouth Kansas, they're going to get rid of um, um, advanced history or something, and the students have to uh, read the speeches of Reagan, and <laughs> yeah, it just came out. I mean, you know, and this is exactly what the PRC is trying to do in Hong Kong. They're trying to control the curriculum that is being taught in the universities and in the secondary schools. So the liberal studies now, which is being taught in secondary schools, is like sociology, is under threat. They want to end it because it makes the students, the young people, think critical thinking. And this is happening in the US. It's happening in the US, you know, for many, many years now, and you don't hear the protest too much about it. It's just a joke that John Stewart makes and everyone laughs, oh, aren't they stupid? It's not that they're stupid, we're stupid. Right? We're letting it happen. So, you know, I mean I just Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And I like something very specific that you said is how um, this movement is being taken up um, and that semantics is really important between the difference uh, between revolution and uh, movement. movement. Those are very uh, polite and very um, political ways. Um, and some of uh, my colleagues in the room have pointed the complacency of the youth in this country. Um, but I also want to point our, our attention toward um, the way that I think the larger, like the, the society at large trivializes some really important movements that are going on. Because I don't know about the rest of you, but I didn't realize that I don't know more was over, or that it didn't matter. Because that is a very youth-based movement as well. And there was just something going on this Friday in town. While it was snowing, a, a bunch of indigenous activists were there. And there were also movements going on in Guala country. Um, so it's just a matter about what matters to the society at large, what is a social movement, and that there are things going on. And um, so I, I, I want to thank you again thank you. for um, making those connections between certain social movements in Hong Kong and what's going on in Paris, because those are really important connections. Yeah, so thank, yeah, you. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Maybe the US, instead of the city in fragments, is the nation in fragments. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, I've been involved with Asian American studies, and, and uh, you know, I support ethnic studies, but there's a way in which these um, interest groups, right, um, really tend to split uh, uh, um, social movement. Uh, so when the Chicanos and Chicanos are out demonstrating for the dream movement, no one else comes out. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, it's not our problem. Do right. you see what I'm saying? Yes. And this whole issue, like, it's not our problem, just suffuses all our thinking, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, it's uh, um, abortion rights. Well, a lot of guys don't give a damn about it um, because it's not our problem, you know? We don't have wombs. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just an enormous issue, I think, um, um, how to incorporate the particular identities and individualisms of Americans and still see the nation as a whole, and what is good for the nation as a whole. 
you know? Um, what, what, what is being an American? What does it mean to be an American? As opposed to what does it mean to be an Asian American? Uh, I think those, those, those are uh, questions we should also be asking. Um, not, not to stop the discussion. I think we should stop. Uh, but I would like to thank you again for thank your you, thank talk. You. And also, I would like to thank um, the departments that uh, helped make this possible, which is the English Department, Anthropology, the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Office of the Provost. And we hope to have Shirley come again. I'm sure that.